God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So well, I think one of the perils of childhood are the shadows in your bedroom. There have been many times uh, recently where I've had to help the girls figure out what it was in their room that was causing a scary monster-like shadow on their walls. Usually it's some kind of innocuous thing, like a shirt falling off a hanger or a doll that's just at the right angle. So when the sliver of light hits it, the shadow looks frightening at night. Scientifically speaking, we know that shadows are caused by light hitting an object that the light cannot pass through. We see shadows most often <clears throat> when the object is between us and the light, causing the shadow to fall on us or at least within our line of vision. But explaining that at night to a child is not comforting. What is helpful is figuring out what is causing the scary picture on the wall and to remove it from in front of the light. During Lent, our sermon series will be called The Valley of Shadows. Traditionally, during Lent, we talk about the growing shadow of the cross that looms on the horizon for Jesus. And during the six weeks of Lent, we make a slow march together towards that cross, which we know awaits Jesus and those who follow him. As the shadows lengthen in these weeks, we'll be spending each week talking about a different shadow in our lives. Since, as I said, said before, shadows are caused by an object between us and the light, it makes sense then that the things that cause shadows in our spiritual lives are the things that come between us and God. Sometimes the things that cause shadows in our spiritual life are bad things. Things that in and of themselves cause brokenness and pain in our lives and in the lives of those we love. Things like lying or addiction or temptation, isolation, self-righteousness. But other times, perhaps just as often, the things that cause shadows in our lives are good things that have either been misused or given too high a priority in our lives. Things like work or money, food, our houses, or even our children can become um, shadows when placed in between us and God. Part of Lent, I think, part of our time in the wilderness is about being attentive to the shadows in our lives, looking for what objects or habits of ours need to be moved and changed to let Christ shine through. In our house, one of the ways that we measure time is by the length of a children's TV show. So um, especially when they first moved in with us, when Eva would ask how long my meeting was going to last, I would tell her about three TV shows so she could figure out how long that was. Or if Ivy wanted to know how long the drive to Aunt Michelle's would take, one TV show, which was always very exciting, one or less. Some, uh, when we were going somewhere that was gonna take a really long time, like a drive to Nana's house, we would tell them that it was a couple of movies long. And that was our version of saying it's a really long time. The Bible's version of a really long time is a number that is used over and over again in scriptures. Anybody know what the number is? That means a really long time? 40, good guess, 40. We have entered into one of those really long times in the church calendar this week as we begin our journey through Lent. This 40-day season, which doesn't count the Sundays, lead us up to Easter, and it's much like Advent in that it's a season of preparation. 40 is a very biblical number and was chosen for Lent in order to call to mind specific stories in Scripture. Noah and his family lived on the ark while it rained for 40 days and nights. 40 is the number of years the Israelites journeyed before reaching the promised land. It is the number of generations that were exiled in Babylon and is the number of days Jesus spent in the wilderness prior to the start of his ministry. You'll notice that each of these examples that use the number 40 in scripture, all of them involved a journey of some kind. They also either led to or came from big changes in the lives of those involved. Noah and his family waited on the ark 40 days and nights as God wiped the face of the earth with a flood that changed everything. The Israelites traveled with no land, no plan other than following God day to day for 40 years until they reached the promised land, the place that helped to seal their identity as God's chosen people. And Jesus spent 40 days in the desert preparing for his public ministry and facing temptation before any of his miracles, teachings, or healings took place. Our gospel lesson this morning from Mark tells us the story of those 40 days. It's a very short passage, only two sentences that describe this long time. Mark is the shortest of the four gospels. He uses fewer words, but in many ways I think he says more than the others do. 
When you read the Gospel of Mark, it is important to pay attention to what is said, but also to what is left unsaid, what he leaves out. The other Gospels who record this part of Jesus' life get a little more wordy with their version of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Matthew has 11 verses, and Luke uses 13 to tell the story. They give you many more details, some of which you probably remember. The temptations that were offered by Satan, turning stone into bread, jumping off the temple because the angels would catch him, or saving the world by worshiping me, and I will give you all that you see. But Mark says none of that. He says simply and succinctly that Jesus was in the wilderness 40 days tempted by Satan. He was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. And that's it. In all three Gospels, this 40-day period occurs just after Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan River and before he calls any of his disciples or begins to proclaim the good news. Matthew tells us that after facing the wilderness, Jesus withdraws to Galilee, and from that time, he says, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Luke says it a little differently. He says, then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. In essence, all three of them are saying the same thing, that the 40 days of wilderness were spent for a purpose. In effect, they set Jesus up and prepare him for the true purpose of his coming, to proclaim the good news of salvation to God's people. I love Mark's version of the temptation because I think it leaves more to the imagination. Mark doesn't tell us what the specific temptations were, which make it easier for me to imagine that Jesus faced the same temptations we face. Matthew and Luke make that harder for me because no one has ever tempted me to turn stone into bread. I have at times turned bread into stone, but that's less of a temptation and more of a disaster. In Mark's version, I'm left to ask questions and to wonder what it really looked like for Jesus in the wilderness. As the writer of Hebrew tells us, he was tempted in all the ways that we are. So Mark leaves details out, but with the little bit that he tells us, we can glean some important things. We know, for instance, that this time for Jesus in the wilderness was time spent alone, away from the crowds and their expectations that would follow him for the next three years, away from the heavy questions he would have to answer, away from the demands of time and energy and love that would come as he entered into relationship with those around him. As one theologian says, it is alone in the wilderness where the real work begins for him and for us. It's also meaningful that Mark uses that word, wilderness, when describing the 40 days. Wilderness is a term rich in significance in the Jewish tradition. And for the early hearers of the gospel story, they would have called to mind the story of Israel's time in the wilderness. It was into the wilderness that God brought them when he first delivered them from slavery to Egypt. It was in the wilderness that they began to learn dependence on God day to day as manna and water and quail, their source of nourishment, came each day. It was also there in the wilderness that God formally constitutes them into a people, a chosen people set apart to God and for God's purposes. It was there in the wilderness that they heard the words from our Old Testament reading this morning. In these verses from Exodus, we hear language that sounds familiar to our ears. I know someone who calls this passage the thou shalts and thou shalt nots. Maybe you hear them as a list of rules or regulations or commandments. But in reality, I think that this list of 10 rules were meant to be way more than just that. They were meant to be formational. They were given to a people who had lived in slavery for generations, a people who didn't know what it looked like to live as free people set apart to be a holy light to the nation. So more than a list of instructions, these words are constitutional for them. They are a message from God to humanity saying, this is who you are. This is who I want you to be. This is how you walk through the wilderness, and this is how you live together in this promised land where I am leading you. We still need those formational words. The truth is that as God's people, we need to be constantly formed and reformed, continually constituted again into a holy people. And I'm not just talking here about all the people out there who are sinners who need to learn the Ten Commandments. I'm talking about all of us in here who need to be reminded that this is who you are and this is who I want you to be. This is how you walk through the wilderness. This is how you live in community with one another. 
Notice that the commandments aren't given by Moses to the Hittites or the Amorites or the Canaanites or the bedbugs that bite or any other group outside of the people of Israel. They weren't given to the skeptics or the unbelievers. They were given to Israel, the ones who were already called, who once called also needed to be formed into God's holy people. We can post them up wherever we want to, but we have to remember that these words in Exodus are here to form us into the people that God has called us to be. In many ways, I think we have been free and living in the world for so long that we don't even realize or remember that we have become slaves to the things of this world. We are enslaved to our own selfish desires, opinions, and ideas, enslaved to our need to keep up with our neighbor, to put up a good front, to look like we're doing well. We are slaves to our own greed, our own pride. We are slaves to the sin in our lives. And like the Israelites who had to learn to be free after leaving Egypt, when we enter into relationship with God, we have to be taught and formed and molded into the kind of people that God wants us to be, constantly constituted into the people of God. So all of that would have come to mind when the original hearers of Mark's gospel heard that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. The reason Jesus can be tempted by Satan in every way and not give in is because he is already formed by the will and word of God. Jesus is, after all, the word made flesh. It is when we allow ourselves to be formed by the word and will of God that we begin to have the strength to say no to the bonds that hold us. It is when we allow the word of God to be enfleshed in us that we can shine a light into the shadow of temptation. Being formed by the word means going back to some of the most basic rules that teach us who we are as a community of God's people. I know that this week I was personally convicted when I read over this list of Ten Commandments. I'm often tempted to skip a day of Sabbath or to sneak a little work in on my day off, not because of the expectations of others, but because there's much to be done and I often feel like I'm behind. I have to remind myself that God rested and that Jesus also took time away to pray and reconnect with God. I certainly am far less important than God and have far less responsibilities, so taking a Sabbath helps me not only reconnect with God, but also helps put my own importance in perspective. As we face our Lenten journey together, we are reminded that just as our spiritual ancestors faced 40 days and came out changed, so too can we. Lent offers us this place where we can come to reflect on our relationship with and our commitment to the one who calls us into life abundant and to make the changes necessary to bring us closer to Christ. A Lenten journey like that makes our Easter proclamation so much more powerful when we, like Jesus, can proclaim the good news to the world that salvation is at hand. One of the ways that we do that in Lent is by giving something up, right? By making some small sacrifice. Some people fast. Some don't eat meat on Fridays or give up chocolate or soda or sweets. Many of us have been taught that we do that in order to be reminded in some way of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And that's true. Jesus made an incredible sacrifice for us, one that we should occasionally reflect on so that we can give proper thanks to God. But I'd also like to encourage you to think of it in another way this year. Lenten discipline should not be about sacrifice for the sake of sacrifice. Maybe instead, the Lenten discipline that we choose to follow should be about making space so that God can fill us with the things we really need, of emptying ourselves of the things that are keeping us from God. Ultimately, I think Lent is about repositioning. It is about removing the objects that are casting shadows in our spiritual lives so that space is created to remind us of our dependence on God, of our need for forgiveness and love and grace and the light that brings life to the world. Any Lenten discipline that we undertake this year ought to be about that kind of repositioning. So as we begin Lent, I offer you the chance to take a moment to reflect on where the shadows are in your life, what kind of repositioning you need to do to let more of the light shine in your life. Sometimes these are going to be easy fixes, right? Like moving the doll in my girl's room that has caused so much trouble, we just moved it into my room so it's not even there to make shadows anymore. But sometimes it will be harder to figure out, more painful to remove, more work to uncover. 
The good news for us is that we are not alone in this journey. If we provide the empty space, the Holy Spirit will come in and fill us with the strength that we need and the answers that we seek. Even though during the next six weeks of Lent, the shadows seem to get deeper and darker and longer and more sinister, we dare to walk through them together because we know that as the psalmist tells us, God is with us, even in the valley of the shadow of death. And we know that on the other side of Lent, the dawn is rising. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.